let me try that again. Hello, everyone. Hello. Thank you for coming to this workshop. This is put on by the MOBAC Technology Committee. We're going to be working on cybersecurity for everyone today. Our first presenter is Stacy DiMatteo. Sorry. D the tomato. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> she is the um, IT manager for the Dudley Knox Library at the Naval Postgraduate School. She'll be talking about security best practices. minus one speaker before uh, Stacy comes up. But I, I just, uh, I was trying to be off camera, okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I just want to say welcome. I'm Jenthi Adelman. I'm the library director here at Monterey County. We're so happy to have you here. We, I love Mobac Tech. I wish I could come and attend all your meetings. I wanted to attend today. This is a really important uh, topic in this day and age, and I won't say why, but <laughs> thank you. Can you can do it. Okay, but thank you so much. <laughs> this, is, this is great. And, and I'll, I'm going to go back to my desk and work, and hopefully you won't learn how to tap into my computer and see if I actually am working. All right, but, uh, but welcome, and thank you so much, Mobac Tech Committee, and thank you all for being here. Okay. Hello, I'm Stacey DiMatteo, not DiTomeo or DiMatteo. Um, I am the systems manager at the Naval Postgraduate School. Um, as you can imagine, we do have a lot of security um, best practices in place there because we're a military base um, as well as federal institution. Um, so I'm going to try to share some of my knowledge with you, which is very limited. Um, I'm not, you know, that knowledgeable. So here we go. That's my school. Very pretty from up top. Um, again, talking about best uh, security practices. Um, I'm going to talk about three sort of brief, um, very briefly, three things that have happened in the last um, eight or nine months to libraries and colleges in the United States. The first one was a distributed denial of service attack against the Library of Congress. And basically what that means, and I have to read it, is the incoming traffic flooding the victims or originates from many different sources. So a lot of different computers are attacking something, the Library of Congress. Basically, that effectively makes it impossible to stop a, an attack um, by blocking a single source because it's from multiple places. Um, this was a widespread outage that covered four days. And it brought down everything within the Library of Congress, so not only the Library of Congress websites and services, it also brought down the U.S. Copyright Office website and services. I don't know if you all heard about that. Um, these are real sort of things that are happening. Um, the Government Accountability Office found that, and I'll talk about this in more in detail um, farther along in the presentation, that poor patch management, you know, updating your systems, making sure that the security updates are um, current as well as bad firewall protections. So these are simple things that we, the staff, or you work together with your IT department can easily fix. The other sort of attack, um, where am I? Oh, Christmas. Sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one, um, is ransomware. I don't know if everyone's heard about ransomware. It basically holds your whatever it is hostage, and you can't get access. It completely locks it down. And the Los Angeles Valley College lost their network, email, and voicemail by, by hackers. Basically locked it down. They ended up paying 28,000 in bitcoins to somewhere in Eastern Europe. Um, and once they got that, the hackers then gave them the key so that they can unlock it. The problem is they have to use that key to unlock every single file. And it's going to take them quite some time to get all of their files open. The other one I'm sure you all have heard about is the St. Louis Public Library was attacked with a ransomware. Again, someone completely shut down all of their services, um, internet access, obviously, affected 700 machines citywide, and they didn't pay. And they have to rebuild their entire system ground up. I don't know if anyone's ever sort of done anything like that, rebuild a network, um, re-image all your machines completely redo all of your websites and your um, systems. 
Um, I haven't. <laughs> um, I imagine it's um, exhausting and terrifying and um, annoying to the patrons. Luckily, with this one, um, patron information was not affected. They did keep that separate, um, but their catalog was wiped out. So all of their, imagine having to redo all of their books or cataloging all of that. Tom, I can't even imagine the cataloger at NPS. Would you die? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so those are the two, three, two examples, ransomware and DDoS, that have actually happened um, that are big news ones because you either pay in bitcoins, it's 28,000 real dollars, but somehow it gets translated into bitcoins. Um, and the other one was they have to fix it, um, and it's a very complicated fix. There are other things that are affecting us as well. Um, some are more minor and some are significant. So phishing, does anyone know what phishing is? Um, I'll read it anyway, unless anyone wants to use their definition. Okay. Phishing emails include a link that directs a user to a dummy site um, that will steal users' information. So basically, it um, mimics one, uh, it will mimic the, almost the look and feel of your website. The only difference is if you hover over the link, it's probably not going to be the same link that you normally would use. Um, and that happens, there's spear phishing, so where they had like the director or someone of vital importance. And then there's just plain old spear phishing, which is us, um, where they'll just send out information and try to get you to click that link, enter your credentials, and there you go, you've completely opened up yourself to a whole host of issues. I'm going to show you a brief video. I'm, I, I got these videos from um, the cybersecurity um, department at the Naval Postgraduate School. We have yearly trainings um, that we have to go to. They're about two hours long. Um, and he gave me these videos that they use for theirs. So let me pull it up. And this is about sort of um, Think before you click. Uh, no? Ah, here we go. All right. Can you see it? Ah, wait. So it's fortunate. Now I have to figure this one out. Did you lose, did I lose you, Karen? Okay. Lots of cyber criminals out there who are trying to entice you into clicking on their nasty Is there really a Nigerian out there that wants to give you $63 million because he likes your face? Is there really someone prepared to sell you a Rolex for $5? Popular examples you need to watch out for include, for example, parcel shipments. If you receive an email from a popular parcel shipment company, maybe you want to think about whether you actually ordered something, and perhaps consider going to their website directly to check it, rather than blindly clicking the link. It's all about being just a little bit cautious about whether that person is truthful or not. Always think twice. Got it. Okay, that was very quiet, right? Could anyone hear it? Okay. Oh. Give in trouble already. You've been here for <laughs> half an hour. Good Lord. Um, now I have to remember how to, I'm going to just try to see if this works, but I think it's going to be a problem. Sorry. Ah, okay. Hey. Um, the other ones, um, so spear phishing, does everyone understand what that is? 
basically, we're going to talk about training. Before you click, look at the link. Um, if it looks suspicious, don't click it. Um, don't download anything from emails that are um, you don't really know about because you're going to basically download something bad. Um, password attacks. I have a couple of videos for password attacks that I'm going to show. Um, I don't know if we have, we don't have a, speakers. I'm wondering if I could turn around this way. But um, basically, they're going to try to steal your passwords. Um, and um, that's not really good. I know Glenn's going to talk about a, a better way of storing passwords um, so that you don't, um, in these examples, kind of give away your information. So if that's OK, I'm going to show some videos. These are funny. OK. Um, cybersecurity lately, largely because of what happened at Sony. Companies and individuals are more concerned about the safety and privacy of their information than ever. President Obama has unveiled a number of new okay. proposals this week to crack down on hackers, and he plans to address this in the State of the Union speech on Tuesday. And it's great that the government is working on this, but the truth of the matter is we need to do a better job of protecting ourselves. You know, the most popular password in the United States is password123. And as long as we're, as long as that's the case, we're vulnerable. So today we sent a camera out on the Hollywood Boulevard to help people by asking them to tell us their password. And <laughs> this is how that went. We're talking about cybersecurity today and how safe people's passwords are. What is one of your online passwords currently? It is my dog's name and the year I graduated from high school. Oh, what kind of dog do you have? I have a Chihuahua Papillon. And what's his name? Jameson. Jameson. And where'd you go to school? Um, I went to school back in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. What school? Uh, Hempfield Area Senior High School. Oh, when did you graduate? In 2009. Oh, great. <laughs> it's like my cat's name and then just like a random number. Okay. Have you had this cat for a while? Yeah, she's my childhood pet. Aw. And what's her name? Her name is Jolie. Jolie. Mm -hmm. So like a password of yours would be Jolie and then a number. Yeah. Like number one? Uh, like my birthday. Oh, when is your birthday? Uh, June 12th. Oh, nice. And what year were you born? Uh, 95. Oh, great. So Jolie, 6, 12, 95. Yes. Got it. So you mean to give my password right now? No, I cannot do that. But we all want to know what it is so we can tell you if it's strong or not. Oh, my goodness. Um, um, let me think. Okay, one is Tel Aviv. <laughs> yeah. Four, six, eight, and then Israel. It's it's only three, but it's you know it's uh, for me it's strong enough. Ireland, one, two, three, four. Gemma, one, two, three. Spell G E M M A. <laughs> well, most of them are Italian. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Like, so like, like, what's a good Italian password? Uh, my grandma's name. What's your grandma's uh, name? Uh, Maria. Maria. So, Maria is your password? Oh, yeah, now you know my password. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, the important thing is they, they learned a uh, terrible lesson. Hi, I'm Jimmy Kimmel. Did you know there are things other than pornography on the internet? Watch them Sorry. on the Jimmy Kimmel Live YouTube channel. Which, much oh, like my God. Body, I be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. Did people not know that, by the way? All right. Um, so don't give out your password. <laughs> These are my tips, people. And here's another one from Ellen. I'll show you these later if you don't see them. I am so sorry. Um, okay. Last night I was flipping around through the channels and I saw this. I, I really love infomercials. I don't know if you love them as much as I do, but I found one. It's a new product that I want to share with you. And, uh, you know, if you have a hard time remembering your online passwords, a lot of people have a lot of different passwords. This is going to solve your problems. Online passwords. There's just too many. And who can remember all those tricky combinations? So you stick them on your monitor or you hide them in a drawer. 
but not anymore. Introducing Password Minder, the personal logbook that takes the hassle out of passwords. Forget about sticky notes or scraps of paper, because Password Minder has been specifically designed to organize and safely store passwords. You'll find them in an instant and never lose a password again, guaranteed. Need to make a password? Just add it to your Password Minder. The alphabetical listing organizes all your usernames and passwords for instant recall and easy reference. I don't have to worry anymore about security or identity theft. I now have all my passwords in one place. It's free. If you have passwords, you need Password Minder. So call now and get your very own Password Minder book for just $10. That's real. That's real. Wait, you're telling me I can keep all my passwords in one place? In this right here and it's only $10? For half the price, you could write all your passwords on a $5 bill. <laughs> this is insane. Does this seem safe to keep all your passwords in one place? In a place that's labeled Internet Password Finder? <laughs> I don't think they thought this through fully. I mean, what if someone gets their hands on your password minder? So I came up with this. It is Ellen's Internet Password Minder Protector, and what you do, yeah, you put it in here, you close it, and then it has a built-in combo combination lock right there, you see on the side, and I know you're thinking, Ellen, what if I forget my combination? Well, if you order now, I will include this, you can put it in there. It's the password minder protector minder. It's the one place to keep your password minder protector combination. And I have one more special offer. If you don't feel like writing down your passwords, send them to me. And for $10, I'll write them down for you. Don't worry about sending me your credit card information. I'll figure it out. <laughs> oh my God, can you believe that? That's what it is. If you see an infomercial you think I should see, send it to me. I love these things. We'll be right back after this. It's funny, but it's true. So how many people put them on post-it notes on their screen? Under their keyboard. On a piece of paper shoved in your desk drawer. Don't do it. Um, you're that person. Um, it's yeah. you're the pocket. You're the password pocket protector, the stealer of passwords. Yeah, it's not a good practice. We laugh about it, but it's really not good. And y'all do it. You're just not admitting it. Okay. Um, Um, okay, so some of the other um, probably lesser known kind of um, attacks that you can experience. Um, we've actually had to have been, um, we've had multiple investigations of possible SQL injection attacks. So that's basically someone can plant a little code into your SQL database and it just spreads awfully from there. Um, and it's apparently quite easy to do. I had to take a security plus certification training. Um, it was very hard. And, and they sort of taught us how to do it, and it seems pretty easy. Um, so it's, it's not very, um, it's very frustrating. Um, Across uh, site scripting, basically re misrepresenting a website. Um, it's almost like phishing. It's mirroring sort of the same thing. Um, and then it'll just take you to this website and basically take all the information that you have. Um, Middleman, um, man in the middle attacks. That's another thing where it's, um, they'll be in the middle of you and your bank. You'll put them information into the man in the middle, and the man in the middle will go to your bank and take out all your money. Um, those are actually pretty common. Um, and then social networking, so that's whole social engineering. Um, Sites like Twitter and Facebook are often used to spread malware. So you click on your Facebook, you click on one of those ads, and 
There you go, you have it. You think it's a cute little cat video. No. Um, and I have a video for that as well. URL. Yeah. All right. Social networking. They have, I think, Australian or British accents. They're so much better than I am at this. Okay. Social networks like Google Plus, Facebook, and Twitter have grown at an extraordinary rate. Hundreds of millions of people are signing up for these services and publishing their personal information to them. But of course, the more people who congregate there, the more attractive it is for the bad guys. And they're exploiting these social networks to spread their spam campaigns, their virus attacks, to launch identity attacks as well. So cybercrime on social networks is booming. Now, there are different ways in which you can protect yourself against these kind of attacks. One thing which you should be doing is you should be locking down your privacy settings, being careful about who you share your information with, and indeed, what information you upload in the first place. If you're not comfortable telling your mother-in-law or your boss a piece of information, why are you uploading it to a social network? Is there ever any real reason why you should be telling someone on the internet your full date of birth, an identity thief's dream? So look at the privacy settings on your social network and lock them down. Make sure you're not sharing stuff inappropriately with the wrong people. But also, you need to be careful about the messages your friends send you. So a friend on Facebook, for instance, might send you a link which says, hey, here's a really cool video, go and check it out. And before you just blindly click on the link, think, was it really my friend who sent me that? Or was it his account which got compromised and is now sending me a link to something which could be a virus, a scam, something trying to trick me into liking it as a result? Now, the social networks are trying to fight this. They're building in anti-spam and anti-virus measures, but ultimately, you're the one responsible for looking after your identity and your account. So you need up-to-date antivirus software as well, and you need a really good dollop, a serving of common sense before you go onto these sites and what you share and how you behave on them. So does anyone think about when they... When they post they're going on vacation on Facebook and their privacy settings, what does that, what potentially could that lead to? Yeah, they're going to look at poor Kristen's going to uh, Thailand on, you know, June 2nd and we're going to go and break in her house. Don't record that. And she's not really going on vacation. Okay. But I mean, those, I mean, not only is it security for libraries, it's security for you, passwords, as well as don't post stuff on Facebook. So now that I sort of scared you about some of the attacks that could happen, there's millions more. We're going to talk about best practices. Okay. All right. Oh. Sorry. There we go. Okay. Passwords. Best practices. So. How often do you all change your passwords at work? Twice a year. How many times do you not change your password? So for Koha, is that managed through an IT or your ILS system? If you have an admin password, is that managed through the settings that your IT people force or is it something you all manage? IT and you. How often do you change those passwords? That's not good. So you should come up with best practices on managing your passwords. Your internal passwords, not the ones that are managed by the IT department. They have software that will pop out and say you have to change your password every six months or based on their policies. But all those internal library ones where the password is library or password or library one, two, three. Um, you got to change those and change those often. Um, come up with some sort of configure or a numbering scheme or some sort of include uppercase, lowercase numbers, characters, those kinds of things because the longer it is, 
the more complex it is, it's the longer it's going to take to get hacked. And you're thinking, it's libraries, who's going to hack you? I showed you in the beginning, they get hacked. Um, I do have a password training, I'll show it in a bit. Training, do training for your folks. You know, show videos like this. Um, you can even train, bring in patrons if you're at a public library, do a training on cybersecurity. But have them learn how to do it or understand the importance of it. Um, okay, scary. No, um, training's really important. You know, staff don't always know to sort of think before they click or that they should change the passwords or whatnot. So it doesn't have to be a formalized training, but have something. Um, inventory. Here's an important thing. Does anyone know what's connected to their network? Does anyone have a detailed inventory of the computers connected to their, to their network? The APs throughout your library connected to the network. Um, printers connected to the network. Have an inventory so that if someone reports there's something funky in that port, you'll know, oh, it's ours, or it's not ours, and we need to investigate it. And then once you do that inventory, do a threat analysis. So what is, uh, what has the most threat on your network? Anything with an IP address? Anything that's outward facing? Um, printers, you know, if they're on the network, they are, a couple of libraries that I know of have had attacks through their printers. They're easy um, to sort of get into. So. Do you know what the threat analysis of that? And then figure out what you're willing to lose. So I'm going to show that video now on passwords. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm Paul Ducklin, and this is a two minute tutorial on how to pick password. Number one, make your passwords hard to guess. The crooks have dictionaries, books, movie scripts, song lyrics, Facebook, Twitter, and much more. So avoid passwords based on nicknames, birthdays, quotations, pets, anything of that sort. And don't forget that easy passwords don't get harder if all you do is add some digits on the end. Password cracking programs can do that as well. Point two, Go as long and complex as you can. Random eight-letter passwords look pretty tough with 26 to the power eight possibilities. That's a whopping 200 billion. But a password cracking server costing less than $20,000 under ideal circumstances can try out more than 100 billion passwords each second. So mix together uppercase, lowercase, digits and punctuation a name for 14 characters, or even longer. That may look terribly complicated, but you can make up a little saying to help you out. If you don't like that approach, some people take several unusual words and combine them into a meaningless phrase. Like the XKCD cartoon's famous correct horse battery staple password. But watch out for words that relate obviously to you. They do need to be unusual. And point three, consider using a password manager. Examples include LastPass, KeyPass, and 1Password. Password managers can make up complex, random nonsense for each account, plus they remember which password goes with what website. That also helps protect you from phishing, because you can't put the right password into the wrong page. But do remember, you will need a really good password for the password manager itself. So let's go over the points again. One, make your passwords hard to guess. Two, go as long and complex as you can. Three, consider using a password manager. And no, we hadn't forgotten. Number four, one account, one password. Don't reuse passwords. Don't make things easy for the crooks. And until next time, stay secure.
So don't use your bank account password for your Gmail account. Just saying. Okay. I think we're going to be talking about that in Glenn's session. Plug, plug, plug. Um, okay, so continue on from current slide. I did it this time. Okay. Okay, um, a couple other best practices. Patch, update. Um, make sure that your server's patched. Make sure you run um, updates. Um, for your computers that your staff or student use, have automatic updates um, turned on. So they'll do, do it weekly. Um, come up with a schedule for patching your servers. You don't necessarily want to turn them on because every time I do that, I break my applications because there's some sort of patch that screws, my, screws up my um, application. So do those manually, but come up with a game plan. I put them on my calendar weekly. It's really important because that's how a lot of these people get in is through poor updating, outdated. Does anyone know when their servers have been last updated? Oh, there's a lot of shaking of heads. Good, okay. Bravo. Um, control. Control who has access to admin privileges. Not every single level of staff should have the same level of privileges. Not one password to rule them all. Everyone should have access to what they need. Obviously, circulation staff need to have access to circulation, but they don't need to have access to the system stuff, right? Um, so don't give out all the password, um, the admin password to all staff. And configure. Make sure you configure applications um, smartly. Make sure you configure. If you have access to your firewalls, make sure that you configure them to se secure best practices in, in securing your systems. Or your applications. If you have application um, access, configure them. Make sure your sites are HTTPS, right? Um, Make sure that they have certificates to ensure that they're safe. Those kinds of things. Um, and then I have this sort of one last funky um, video that I got from ITAX, that's our IT department, of another sort of terrifying hacking thing called war biking. wireless technology in our everyday lives, but many of us are giving away much more information than we might appreciate. We're here in San Francisco with a special bike equipped with wireless scanning technology to find out exactly how much information people are giving away. Big cities like these often tend to have lots of information from consumers who happen to be strolling past. Mobile devices, people walking down the street. My little scanner is picking up information from everyone's mobile phones around as they liberally connect to any hotspot that says it offers free internet with no idea about whether they're being monitored, manipulated or otherwise. Over the course of our ride, we detected nearly 190,000 clients and 72,312 networks. And out of those, a staggering 9.5% are using WEP, an algorithm that's been known and broken for an astonishing number of years now. We also saw 19.3% of networks using no encryption at all. So anyone using those are just shouting their information out to the world for anyone to see. 57.7% are using WPA, or no longer recommended algorithms that the attackers could potentially go after. That means your devices, your employees, and your intellectual property potentially open to attack. This is the first stage in our world of war biking, where we'll be taking this specially equipped bike to cities all over the world to find out just how much information we're all giving away. This is War Biking San Francisco, brought to you by Sophos. Kind of weird, but it tells you that. Does anyone know what their security 
settings are for their access points. You need to make sure that they're using the recommended um, security settings for those because you want to also protect your patrons. So um, that's it for me. I have a slide that says thank you. I'll put it up now. Hold on, it's coming. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? Glenn? Wait, wait, wait. Oh. No hard ones, please. Okay. Thanks. In that last video, he um, mentioned several specific standards for um, wireless security. Yeah. And two of them he mentioned are obsolete. What's, what's the current one that we should be using? Um, we use AES. Um, I think WEP2 is also, or WPA2 is sort of outdated as well. Um, AES and, uh, yeah, that's the one we use. I, I wouldn't, I can find out for you. I can look real quick too. Printing that using something like AES to encrypt is the secret to keep keeping it so people can't hack into your printers. It's a it's a good thing. Okay. Um, you know, people are sophisticated and they get cracked all the time. I mean, you can see over years it started out with WEP and has gone on. Um, I mean, I'm not going to sit here on recorded TV and say it's going to protect you, but it will protect at least for now. You can ask harder ones too if you want, but I won't know the answer. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Are we running on to Karen? Karen. Okay. Let me get her set up first. I'm going to stop sharing. Oh, I'm no longer sharing. You're going to share with me. Okay.